I'm sure you've heard of how we date rocks using isotopes, but there's actually different types of isotopes, and not all of them are good for dating, but they can be good for other things. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the difference between the two major types of isotopes, stable isotopes and radioactive ones. In terms of what we'll go over, we will talk about what isotopes are, just to make sure we're all on the same page. We'll talk about radioactive versus stable isotopes, the differences between them. Then we'll talk about the use or applications of radioactive isotopes for geochronology or dating rocks. And then we'll talk about the use or applications of stable isotopes for things like paleoclimate or paleoceanography. In other words, reconstructing ancient climatic and oceanographic conditions. So first things first, what are isotopes? Well, if we look at the periodic table, we see numbers above each atom. This is the atomic number or the number of protons in that element and the number of protons or that atomic number defines that element. If the number of protons changes, the element changes. However, there are both protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom in these elements nuclei. And so if the number of neutrons changes rather than the protons, that changes the isotope, but not not the element. So each of these elements can have different isotopes. So they have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. For example, carbon. Carbon has three naturally occurring isotopes, carbon-12 with six neutrons, carbon-13 with seven neutrons, and carbon-14 with eight neutrons, all with six protons because that defines carbon. But there's a difference between these isotopes for carbon. Carbon-14 is actually radioactive. In other words, that nucleus with eight neutrons and six protons is unstable and it decays over time into a stable product. Whereas carbon-12 and 13 are stable isotopes, and we will talk about the applications of carbon-12 and 13 and other stable isotopes in later slides. First, let's talk about radioactive decay and the applications of radioactive isotopes. So what is radioactive decay? Well, it's the spontaneous atomic transformation or nuclear transformation of an unstable or radioactive nucleus or parent isotope into a stable daughter isotope or a stable nucleus. Um, and during this process of becoming more stable during the decay process, there's a release of energy. Uh, in this particular case, this represents two neutrons and two protons being released from this nucleus to become more stable. And this alpha particle or two neutrons and two protons is the release of energy. In some cases, you can just have the release of a beta particle or a negative charge. In some cases, you can capture a beta particle to become more stable over time. So there's different ways of radioactive decay, in other words, and I won't go over those in this video because I have a video talking about absolute dating and I talk about the decay processes in that video. But for the purposes of this video, let's talk about how we can actually apply this process of radioactive decay to dating rocks. Basically, this technique is called absolute dating. It can also sometimes be called isotopic dating or radiometric dating. But the gist of it is that because isotopes decay at a constant rate, we can use that rate, which is called a half-life, to calculate how many years have gone by since that rock formed. So half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half of the parent isotope, the original unstable isotope, to decay into the stable daughter product. We can look at this graphically for the example of carbon. So recall that carbon-14 is the radioactive isotope of carbon and therefore undergoes decay. And we can see after it just forms, it has 100% carbon-14, the parent isotope, in its composition. And then after one half-life has passed, uh, it has only 50% of original carbon-14 left. After two half-lives have passed, it only has 25%. After three, it has 12.5% each time it's halving uh, the percentage left or the mass of carbon-14 left in the rock. Um, and we can then calculate, based on how many half-lives have passed, the amount of years that have passed because we know the amount of years in the half-life for each isotope system. For example, here are some common isotope systems we use for radiometric dating, including carbon around 6,000 years, potassium dating around 1 billion years for its half-life, uranium dating with a 4.5 billion year half-life, and rubidium dating with a 49 billion year half-life. And remember, a full half-life doesn't actually have to go by for us to be able to date 
the rock using that isotope method because all we need to know is the fraction of a half-life that has gone by if a full one hasn't gone by and then we can still calculate the age of the rock that way. All we have to do is measure the ratio of parent to daughter isotope in the rock and that will tell us how many half-lifes and therefore how many years have gone by since the rock formed. Now, note here that some isotopes have relatively short half-lives, such as carbon. Carbon-14 decay has a half-life of around 5,700 years, which means that after around 50,000 years, that rock will no longer have any parent isotope or carbon-14 left, and you can no longer get the ratio of parent-to-daughter isotope, and therefore you cannot date rocks older than around 50,000 years using carbon dating. You would have to use a different method that has a longer half-life. This is very important because a lot of people think the only type of dating the geologists use is carbon dating. That is not the case, even though I always get asked, did we date Earth with carbon dating? No, we did not, because we can't date something billions of years old using carbon. It has all decayed by then. That is very important, and I talk about that more in the How We Dated Earth video. I'll link it up to the top right if you want to check it out. That is how we use radioactive isotopes, however. Stable isotopes like carbon-12 and 13 do not decay. They are stable over time. So how can we use stable isotopes if they're not decaying? We can't use them for dating because they're not decaying over time. They're not a clock like radioactive isotopes are, but we can use them in other ways, such as for paleoclimate reconstruction. So how does this work? Well, we use the heavy to light stable isotope ratio as shown here for the examples of carbon-13 to 12 ratios, uh, oxygen 18 to 16 ratios, as well as sulfur 34 and sulfur 32 isotopes. All of these isotope numbers are just representing the number of protons plus neutrons. And the heavy to light terminology here is just because when you have more neutrons, it's technically a heavier um, nucleus. It has more mass because it has more neutrons. And when it has less neutrons, it is light because it's less mass. It's less heavy. So that's kind of what we call the isotopes with more neutrons versus less. We just say heavy versus light. Then we actually use what's called the delta notation to actually get reliable isotopic compositions of rocks. Um, so basically we just standardize the isotope ratio by comparing it to a standard, a known standard, uh, so that we can all use the same kind of notation and isotope values and compare them to one another without them meaning absolutely nothing. So we have to standardize them to make them have meaning. Because of the way we standardize the delta notation, they can be negative or positive relative to the standard. And the way to think about this is the positive ones are heavier. They're enriched in the heavy isotope and therefore have a higher ratio. And the negative ones are lighter, they are depleted in a heavy isotope and therefore have a lower or a lighter composition or ratio. And we can measure isotope ratios in a bunch of different materials and standardize them because standards have been defined for each isotope system, stable isotope system in various materials. And so now let's get to why are these ratios useful? What actually affects these ratios to make them useful for us to even measure in the first place? Well, because stable isotopes do not decay, their relative abundances on Earth remain constant. So here's the natural abundance of different isotopes of carbon, oxygen, and sulfur on Earth. And these, you know, relative abundances will stay constant because these are stable isotopes. But the relative abundances in different materials may vary. So even though their entire Earth relative abundance, so carbon-13 relative to 12, will remain the same if we look at Earth as a whole, these ratios might vary if we look at different materials. For example, the relative amount of carbon-13 to 12 in carbonaceous rocks versus in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere versus in carbon dioxide dissolved in water versus in carbon in plants. So all of these things can vary um, because we're not looking at it as a whole anymore. We're looking at it in different materials. But why do they vary in these different materials? Why don't they just remain the same? What changes this ratio or fractionates the isotopes? That's kind of what we call when the isotope ratio changes, we call it fractionation. It becomes fractionated. So the thing that typically causes isotope fractionation or isotope ratios in different materials to be different is mass. Because there are a lot of mass-dependent processes on Earth, there is mass-dependent fractionation of isotopes, such as 
carbon, oxygen, and sulfur isotopes in various materials. However, I say for the most part here, because sometimes there can be mass independent fractionation, which we'll talk about later and give an example. So for examples of mass dependent fractionation, we have oxygen isotopes where we have oxygen and water, H2O, that's, you know, the formula of water, it has oxygen in it, and it's made of all sorts of oxygen isotopes, uh, 16, 17, and 18 isotopes of oxygen. Uh, but the lighter oxygen will preferentially evaporate because in terms of mass, it's you know favored in terms of evaporation because it's easier to evaporate something light than heavy. So light oxygen, oxygen 16, will preferentially evaporate, and oxygen 18, heavy oxygen, will preferentially remain in solution. An example of carbon isotope fractionation can be seen with plants. Plants take up carbon dioxide to photosynthesize, and as they do so, they preferentially take up carbon 12, or light carbon isotopes, and leave behind heavier carbon isotopes in the atmosphere. And a similar process occurs for sulfur-eating microbes. Sulfur-eating microbes like to take up lighter sulfur isotopes, sulfur-32, and leave behind heavier sulfur-34 in the water, um, and so therefore are fractionating the isotopes. If we look at each of these systems, what we'll see is that light isotopes are evaporating and becoming uh, part of the air atmosphere system in the water um, oxygen isotope scenario, and heavy oxygen-18 isotopes are preferentially remaining in the uh, I guess, ocean analogy here. Uh, and then in the plant scenario, in the carbon scenario, we have light isotopes being incorporated into the biomass of the plant and heavy carbon-13 remaining back in the atmosphere. Um, and in the case for the sulfur isotopes, we have light isotopes preferentially being incorporated into the bacteria. And then in the final product that the bacteria produce in terms of the final sulfur product, whereas the initial sulfur compound they use remains heavy in the water or the ocean or environment in this scenario. So in other words, climatic processes, warming, cooling, can control oxygen and carbon isotope trends. Um, I'll, I'll talk about sulfur later. For this slide, we'll focus on oxygen and carbon. So oxygen and carbon isotopes record negative and positive excursions throughout geologic time. What does this mean? Well, when we measure oxygen isotope ratios and carbon isotope ratios in the rock record, we see spikes upward and spikes downward, and we can tell what those mean uh, based on what we know about how those isotopes fractionate through natural environments. So for example, negative carbon isotope excursions in carbonate material, which I'll explain in a second, suggest periods of great carbon emission rather than the alternative, which is carbon burial. So why is this? Well, like I mentioned earlier, phototrophs, or plants, take up light carbon, carbon-12 preferentially, and they leave behind heavier carbon, carbon-13, in the atmosphere for abiotically formed carbonaceous rocks like carbonates to form. And so basically the carbonates kind of represent atmospheric carbon uh, when we look in the rock record, whereas plant material, which eventually becomes organic matter in the rock record, represents the phototroph uptake of light carbon uh, in the rock record. So during periods of great carbon emission, because of a bunch of organic matter burning or oxidation, for example, during periods of volcanism where lava has burnt uh, huge deposits of organic carbon, uh, that causes great carbon emission because it oxidizes the organic carbon to carbon dioxide, which releases into the atmosphere. And uh, during that period, the atmospheric carbon gets much lighter because all of that carbon it's burning and oxidizing is light from the phototrophic uptake of light carbon. That then causes the carbonates to take up that you know new atmospheric composition of much lighter carbon. Therefore, you have a negative spike in carbonate uh, carbon isotope ratios. Negative oxygen isotope excursions in the ocean suggest higher temperature, periods of higher temperature or global warming. How? Uh, well, during periods of higher temperature or warmer periods in Earth's history, heavier oxygen isotopes can evaporate uh, from the ocean. Why heavier? Because remember, we're not looking at a singular isotope that's evaporating. We're looking at the ratio of isotopes evaporating. So for example, in colder periods, you have less evaporation and it's not strong enough really 
to evaporate any heavy oxygen 18. So the oxygen 18 to 16 ratio in the atmosphere is very light. It's very rich in 16 because that's all it can handle to evaporate. Whereas in warmer period, evaporation is much stronger and can actually evaporate more oxygen 18 that brings up the oxygen 18 to 16 ratio in the atmosphere. So it's a ratio. It's not that oxygen 18 is more enriched than oxygen 16 in the evaporated material. It's just that it's more enriched in oxygen 18 than it is during colder periods. But overall, the 16 is still dominant. It's still the dominant isotope. It's just that we have more 18. So the ratio is higher. So during periods of higher temperature, you get a higher oxygen 18 to 16 ratio that evaporates and becomes part of you know the oxygen in the atmosphere leaving behind a lighter signature or a more negative isotope ratio signature in the ocean, which is then preserved by carbonate shells. Remember, calcium carbonate not only contains carbon, but also contains oxygen. And so oxygen can be incorporated from the ocean into these shells, and then we can measure it later on and get the isotope ratio of both carbon and oxygen. And then eventually, the oxygen in the atmosphere that was heavier rains out, and then we can actually get, um, depending on what precipitates from that rain, probably you know terrestrial carbonate material. We can then measure that ratio and see that during the time of the light ocean oxygen isotope signature, there's uh, equal and opposite heavy oxygen signature from what precipitated from rainwater, which represents the atmosphere at the time. So all of this is very, you know, dynamic environmental processes, but the gist is the ocean oxygen isotopes and the atmospheric oxygen isotopes trend in opposite directions. And the same concept goes for carbon, the organic carbon and the inorganic carbon trend in opposite directions. So we can kind of find these spikes in the rock record and see based on the trends in both materials, what caused those spikes. So where do we get these ratios? Well, here, you know, we I mentioned carbonate. So carbonate material is a big one, but there are others. Um, for modern isotope ratios, we can actually measure isotope ratios in water, plants, and modern sediment. Uh, for ancient isotope ratios, we obviously have to look at rocks um, and also fossils, uh, which is where this calcium carbonate is typical. Um, so calcium carbonate can either be aragonite or calcite. Both are calcium carbonate in composition. The only difference between these two minerals is their structure. Um, it doesn't really matter for the isotope ratios. We can get the isotope ratios of either. And the reason that calcium carbonate is great is because, you know, marine life uses it to build skeletons. Um, so therefore, it represents the marine water column isotope composition of both carbon and oxygen at the time. We know this for all organisms that use calcium carbonate because we can look at the modern water isotopes and modern calcium carbonate organisms and see that they represent the water isotope ratios. Uh, we can also use shales or organic carbon, which preserve carbon isotopes. But these shales can also preserve a lot of other isotopes called non-traditional isotopes, which we use for reconstructing other parameters of Earth's history and ancient Earth conditions. And I'll talk about that on a later slide. Sometimes, in fact, there are even air bubbles preserved in minerals like salt, ice, and amber. And these represent ancient atmosphere. Um, you know, if the bubble is closed off, and if it's closed off and preserved in a crystalline mineral material, we can then look at the oxygen and carbon isotope ratios in these bubbles. We can even apply stable isotope applications to looking for the first life on Earth or when life evolved on Earth. Uh, for example, an archean aged graphite formation around 3.7 billion years old uh, contains light carbon isotope signatures that may represent early life. Because if you remember, phototrophic organisms take up light carbon, but this is kind of hand wavy at the moment. Our more robust fossils indicating life are around 3.5 billion years old. So I think that's still the consensus until we can prove these older um, bits of evidence for life. I think there's even some evidence that points to 3.9 billion years now, but again, it's a bit more hand wavy than our more robust 3.5 billion year old life evidence. But we can also apply carbon isotopes to a modern understanding of processes. For example, preserved organic carbon, aka fossil fuels, what we use today to get energy, 
represent ancient plant material and therefore contain very light carbon isotope ratios. So when we go and release these, you know, light isotopes into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, we basically bring the average atmospheric carbon isotope ratio down to a lighter value because we're providing more carbon-12. We're also actually bringing down the relative abundance of carbon-14 in the atmosphere because we're releasing stuff that's very old and therefore has no more carbon-14 in it. Because remember, carbon-14 decays over time and there's none left in the stuff that we're burning because it's so old that it's all decayed. Um, so we're also decreasing the relative abundance of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Therefore, we can actually quantify exactly how much carbon in the atmosphere is due to the modern burning of fossil fuels by man. In other words, we can quantify, numerically quantify, the human impact on global warming. I'm not getting into this in this video. I don't want to debate anybody in the comments, but carbon isotopes prove that humans do have an impact on the amount and composition of carbon in the atmosphere. But that being said, I do not believe that it matters whether you think it's man-made or not. The point is we can measure that something's changing and it's having harmful consequences. And whether humans have caused it or not, we can actually do something about it. So, you know, even if we haven't, we should do something about it. We should try and fix it regardless of the cause. Moving on now, there are other ways to measure isotopes that don't have to rely on mass dependent fractionation. Uh, so for example, the sulfur isotope delta notation is sulfur 34, which is the 34 to 32 ratio a uh, mass difference of two units because there's two more neutrons at 34 than 32. Uh, but sulfur 33 is another isotope of sulfur, slightly less abundant, which is why we don't typically use it, but we can use it. Um, and it has a mass difference of one unit. Uh, the way we can use it is by checking that the delta sulfur 34 value should be twice as large as the delta 33 value because it has you know twice the mass difference. So if the fractionation of the isotopes is due to mass differences, this should be the case. It should be twice as large. Um, so in other words, the sulfur 33 delta value minus uh, the sulfur 34 delta value divided by two should be zero. That should come out to zero if it's fractionating based on mass. And this is called isotope offset, and it has a big delta instead of a little delta. <laughs> um, and so this is isotope offset, whereas this delta, small delta notation is called isotope composition. Now, why is this important if we should just expect to see zero? Because we don't always. Uh, before 2.4 billion years ago, sulfur isotopes were weird. In other words, the sulfur isotope offset uh, didn't come out to zero. It actually was all over the place, as you can see on this graph here, until around 2.4 billion years ago when it finally did act normal. And this coincidentally coincides with the GOE or the Great Oxidation Event. So why was it acting weird before the GOE and normal after? Well, this is due to the fact that afterwards, mass-dependent fractionation of sulfur isotopes was occurring, and before, mass-independent fractionation of isotopes was occurring. Why is this the case? Well, in the reducing atmosphere or non-oxygenated atmosphere of the Archean before the Great Oxidation event occurred, we had MIF or mass independent fractionation of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere that broke up the sulfur dioxide. And then that signal of mass independent fractionation got preserved. Whereas in today's atmosphere, you still get sulfur dioxide being broken up independent of mass from UV light, just like it did back then. But instead of that signal being preserved, the sulfur that then goes back down to Earth's surface and becomes preserved in the rock record becomes reoxidized because now the atmosphere and oceans are oxidized and have oxygen. And that reoxidation process refractionates the isotopes depending on mass rather than not dependent on mass. And that causes the sulfur offset to go back to zero. However, light stable isotopes like oxygen, carbon, sulfur, everything in the upper part of the periodic table are not the only things that we can use to reconstruct paleoclimate, paleoceanographic conditions. Other isotopes, like heavier ones, uh, like transition metals like iron, molybdenum, thallium, vanadium, uranium, all of these things listed here and more can also be used to do this. And these are called non-traditional stable isotopes uh, because they're just not as traditional as your, you know, oxygen, carbon, etc. 
these can mass dependently fractionate and can also sometimes fractionate depending on other things that aren't mass. Um, many are paleo-redox proxies because the isotopes behave differently and become preserved differently depending on redox conditions of the past. In other words, depending on whether the ocean, for example, was oxygenated or anoxic. So we can reconstruct ancient redox or oxygenation conditions using isotope ratios of such you know, elements in the rock record. Uh, this is due to the fact that many of these isotopes or elements are redox sensitive. They behave differently under oxic versus anox conditions. This is actually the same case for molybdenum. Uh, molybdenum is the thing I study for my dissertation research, and that is a redox sensitive element, and I study the way it behaves differently in those different environments so that we can better understand what parameters we can reconstruct using molybdenum paleoredox proxies. Um, so for example, um, I also study thallium, but it's not for my dissertation. It's like a side project that I'm doing. But thallium is also redox sensitive. It behaves differently in oxygenated versus reducing conditions. In oxic conditions, it absorbs to manganese oxides and actually becomes uh, buried in manganese rich sediment. And with this absorption to manganese oxides, there's a known thallium isotope fractionation and we can use this known fractionation to basically predict what the isotope fractionation should be if the environment was oxic with manganese oxide burial versus if it wasn't. However, there's a lot of research still going into these things because we don't necessarily understand all the processes that are causing the fractionation. All we can say with certainty for a lot of these elemental and isotopic systems is that this is the fractionation in this type of material under these types of conditions, and this is the fractionation under these types of conditions in this material. They're fundamentally different, they're systematically different, so they're consistent and reliable, but because we don't understand the reason behind the fractionation, it kind of limits the amount of reliability behind these proxies. Uh, so there's so much research being poured into understanding the actual isotope fractionation mechanisms, why they're fractionating, just like I showed for the carbon and oxygen isotopes, um, so that we can better understand what we're reconstructing. <laughs> and lastly, I just want to mention that it's not just redox conditions that we can reconstruct. We can also reconstruct pH conditions, temperature conditions, primary productivity rates, uh, more spreading rates, uh, mid-ocean ridge spreading rates, depending on magnesium calcium ratios and all of these things. I've talked about some of these in other videos, but we can reconstruct an enormous amount of parameters using our understanding of how these isotopes fractionate in various conditions. So these are the differences between stable and radioactive isotopes and the ways in which we can apply these isotopes to understanding geologic history a little bit better. So if you want to check out any related videos, I have a video about how we date Earth using radiometric dating, for example, and I'll put it up here on the screen somewhere. And if you want to check out any other type of Earth history content, I'll put the playlist up on the screen as well. And if you guys want to check out the references I'm using for this video, they're linked in my description below. And with that, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye!